All right, everybody, welcome to another live cast here on the Game Wisdom channel. I am, of course, Josh Spicer, and we have a great cast for you tonight. We are going to be once again talking about the intersection of psychology and video game design. And joining me is the owner of the website, Psycho The Psychology of Video Games. He has his first book, Getting Gamers, The Psychology of Video Games, out now, and his second book will be coming out very soon. But please welcome back to the podcast a friend of mine, Jamie Madigan. Hey, thanks. Glad to be back. It's great to have you on, Jamie. It feels like it's been like years since we last spoke. <laughs> Might have been. It's been uh, several months at any rate. Mm -hmm. but yeah. So how are you doing? Good, good. Uh, busy. Things uh, between day job, uh, the work in, and then uh, trying to keep things going with the website, and then recently wrapping up the submission of my manuscript for my next book, um, which I should be sending out by the end of this month. Congrats. And do you have a Thanks. title for your next book yet? Yeah, so it's, it's going to be staying on the, the psychology and video games topic, but this one is going to be called Working Title at any rate, um, subject to change. But the title is uh, Getting Gamers. Now, that's the, the old <laughs> one. Working title is Boss Strategies, Why Your Workplace Should Look More Like a Video Game. Uh, so it's going to be dealing with kind of how you can be a better manager or leader with lessons that you learn from video games. So it's a lot of stuff about uh, motivating people, uh, getting people to pursue goals, getting people to be flexible, getting them to learn. Uh, getting them to work together in teams and to sort of share mental models and uh, how to build an effective workplace culture and sort of all things around psychology that game designers have found to be very effective for developing video games and how that can help managers and other leaders in a workplace do their job more effectively and sort of develop the kind of culture and the kind of workplace that they want. Great. And I guess, uh, keeping with that theme, I guess I'm curious about your thoughts, Jamie, on the whole idea of gamification. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure, like, uh, I, we're both kind of aware, like, that kind of became, like, the hot buzz term about, like, I would say maybe, like, a decade ago, maybe a little less than that. And it started then, yeah. I was just wondering, like, what do you think about that as, like, a way of motivating people or keeping them engaged? Yeah, I mean, this this book is not really a gamification book, so it's mm -hmm. not going to teach you how to implement game-like systems in the workplace or elsewhere. Um, so I didn't do a whole lot of digging you know, on the topic, but um, from what I've seen, gamification can be done well, it can be very effective, uh, and it can sort of rely on a lot of those same uh, psychology um, and motivational you know, aspects that make other approaches at the work in the workplace work. Uh, but it can also be done very poorly, and if you just sort of slap points, badges, and leaderboards on something without attending to the underlying like motivation for why people want to do something, the rewards they get out of it, um, <clears throat> why they would want to be doing something in the first place, um, then you're not going to get very far. So, you know, I've seen gamification approaches uh, in school, at work, and shopping, and the political process, uh, just sort of thrown out there or you know we want to do some sort of gamification because we want to check that off on mm -hmm. on the buzz list you know the checklist of features to show that we're paying attention to what's uh, what's cutting edge these days um, but I think that there are a few researchers out there that are doing a really good job and of, of understanding why it works and a lot of times it just kind of loops back to the same lessons of psychology that we've known before or like you know, people are motivated to, to do work when it lets them sort of choose how they do it, when it gives them meaningful rewards, uh, when it sort of helps them master or develop a skill. And the gamification dressing around that can help, you know, sell that and clarify that and give them um, effective feedback about how they're doing and how they're progressing towards those goals. But in and of itself, it's not going to be that perspective. Well, I don't, I don't think that's probably a very controversial statement amongst people who know more about gamification than I do. Mm -hmm. uh, but as it often happens, it's not what you do, but how effectively you do it or how well you implement it that matters. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's always been, like, the weird thing for me. Like, you would think from the outside, somebody who plays video games on a day-to-day basis, like, gamification would be, you know, the perfect thing for me. But mm-hmm. it just never really, like, motivated me. Like, I've always been, like, one of those people that I, if I'm not invested in the task at hand, you mm-hmm. know, no amount of window dressing is going to convince me otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the motivation got has got to come first. Um, you know, you got to have a reason for wanting to do what you're doing, a reason for wanting to learn the material or engage on the task and hit the target. Yeah, and we'll be talking about motivation probably as one of our main topics in the the coming minutes. Mm-hmm. But I was just talking to Jamie before the cast. Like, yeah, it's been a very busy time. I've been talking to libraries and schools about doing like presentations for teens. My second book is going to be hopefully out by October, and cool. it's just going to be like this is my work summer. I guess for you, Jamie, are you having like a work summer as well? <laughs> In a lot of ways, yeah. I think things will will ease up uh, quite a bit once I get this manuscript sent mm-hmm. on, and there will be probably a, a long period where you know my editors look at it and provide feedback, yeah. and then they they'll come back with like, hey, can you? make these changes, you know, we've been through this, like, one round of this so far, mm-hmm. um, but, you know, they're not going to be, like, rewrite chapters four through eight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope I don't have that with my book, I really... Yeah, no, it's, it's oh, going to be gosh. tweaks and minor stuff, so mm-hmm. the, the bulk of the work is is already done, um, so it'll, it'll be just a lot of that, and then I think things are going to um, lighten up, and, you know, I've been preoccupied with that stuff, so I've got some plans for you know, getting back uh, on schedule and uh, putting out some articles uh, on the website uh, like I do every month and, you know, new episodes of the podcast and maybe some other uh, fun stuff as well. Mm-hmm. I got to ask, as again, like talking to like one person who's got a book published to the other, did you have to source your own images for your books? No. So that's that's oh. the good thing about working with um the, the publisher that I am is that they take care of all of that sort of Ugh. stuff. Um, they'll create artwork and the, the book is going to have a heavy visual element to it, which is, I think, cool. Much more visual than my, my last book, which was just hundreds of pages of text. You know, mm-hmm. This will have graphs and tables and images and um, all kinds of just sort of visual treatments through you know font and spacing and, and all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. I think it's gonna it's gonna turn out to be a really kind of cool uh, and interesting book to work with, and they have people that that do all that sort of stuff. I get to like approve all of it, so they'll they'll send me proofs and final versions and all that. And if I really think something is awful or misses the mark or miscommunicates what I was trying to say, then you know I'll have a chance to push back on them and and uh, ask them to change it and so forth. But uh, I don't think there'll be a whole lot of that based on what I've seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had to find all the images myself, so I just source about 120 images. Yeah, um, even just finding like screenshots of a game or mm-hmm. something real simple like that. It's like you don't want to just do a Google image search and grab somebody else's work, uh, somebody else's screenshots. Oh, so you got to do it yourself, or you know, source it or get. There's yeah. like I think there's a special place in hell for having <laughs> to get your own image of a video game. Yeah. While you're trying to play it at the same time, like you should have seen me do like my uh, hand gymnastics of playing. I was uh, playing a Batman <laughs> for the NES a few days ago. Oh, I had God. to use the controller, get him in the right move for a wall jump, snap the hit the screenshot on the keyboard, all while making sure to keep everything in place. <laughs> Reminds me of my old uh, days playing like the Atari Twenty Six Hundred when I was a little kid, and you could. You know, if you beat some games, you could take a picture of your TV and then mail it in, and they would send you this little certificate. So I was playing, like, River Raid or something. <laughs> I forget what game it was, but made it to that point. And, yeah, I'm, like, trying to take a picture and not have it, like, reflected off the, t- the TV screen. I think uh, I so did that. A long way. I think I did that with the game Plock, if you ever heard, if you remember that game for the SNES. No. Uh, I'm dating myself, and... <laughs> for the cast here. Oh, yeah. I remember the hell. I was I had to get a screenshot of another world. And I had oh, to get okay. a perfect one of the character game like thrown over like a 
a edge by the alien, but I had to mm-hmm. play the game for 30 minutes beforehand to get that screenshot. So I had to go through that yeah. entire game again. Yeah, I remember when I, I was doing game reviews and so mm-hmm. forth, that was always the thing too. It's just like, just jam on the on the, the print screen or the screenshot key and just take 100 and try to go back yeah. in later and fish them out. And then you're like, <laughs> uh, I don't I, I have like 600 screenshots all from the same level of the game because <laughs> I didn't bother to take anywhere else. So. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's uh, it's more work than you think. It's nice to have yeah, yes. other people to work with. Yes, it is. For all the people watching, they're like wondering what the hell we're talking about when it comes to writing a book. But uh, to get back on topic, since it has been a while since you were on, Jamie, could you kind of talk a little bit about your background and what the uh, psychology of games is, or psychology of video sure. games? Yeah, so I have a background in psychology, a PhD in psychology. Um, my specific flavor or specialization within the field is industrial organizational psychology, which is taking um, lessons and methods from psychology and applying them to the workplace. And my my favorite sort of pithy definition is uh, making work suck less. Um, so that that's what we as as industrial organizational psychologists or IO psychologists try to do. Um, so. Then there you can sort of see the connection to the Boss Strategies book, where I'm, you know, trying to take this lessons of psychology and video games and loop them back around to the workplace and and making work suck less. Um, so in my, in my day job, I am um, a product manager or the product lead for a startup company called LeaderAmp, uh, and we have like an app and a platform that helps scale like leadership development. So if you've got people that you, you know, managers that you want to sort of get better at their jobs, one thing that people often do is have them work with a coach, a leader uh, development coach who will sort of work with them and say, you know, okay, go through some assessments and say, these are your skills, these are the areas you need to work on, and I'm going to coach you on how to do that. And so we have technology and science to sort of facilitate that. Um, so that that's my day job. That's what keeps me busy throughout the day and some evenings. And then I also run psychologyofgames.com, um, which is going on 10 years old. I think it'll be later this year um, that it will have been 10 years since I made the first post on that uh, website, which is kind of incredible now, now that I think about it. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, thanks. Yeah. So I'll, maybe I'll, I'll do something <laughs> special if I can find the time. Um, but... Psychology of Games aims to, to look at the intersection of psychology and video games. So the, the line that I usually use is that try to dive into the psychology literature and understand what it has to say about why games are so often designed as they are. So like, why, why do these certain game design tropes work so well? You know, why are there core, why do core loops work? Why do, um, you know, certain reward structures work and so forth? Uh, I also look at why uh, games are marketed and sold as they are. So, w- what's the psychology behind you know the pricing and the marketing that you often find with games, and that becomes more and more relevant with the whole games as a service model that we've seen evolve over the last few years. Mm-hmm. And then also just trying to look at like what effects games have on people and playing games have on people, and that's where you get discussions around you know, media effects and violence in video games and gaming addiction and and all that other sort of stuff. So sort of seeing what the science says about all of those topics as well. Um, So I, you know, apply my background and uh, most of the articles that I write are, uh, actually probably all of the articles that I I put up there have, you know, citations and are, are look at actual research and will say, you know, in this study or in this book uh, written by uh, you know, somebody who has proper credentials to be researching this kind of stuff. This is what they said, uh, and here's what it may mean for video games, whether it was specifically about video games or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so, mm-hmm. publish articles there. I do a regular podcast uh, as well, where I will bring on an expert <clears throat> in some topic on psychology and video games, and then talk with them for a while. And I've, I've hit upon a format that sort of minimizes the amount of work that I have to do. Because uh, I let the guests just kind <laughs> of do all the talking and just ask them a few questions along the way, uh, and that seems to work out pretty well. Um, but the guests are typically like researchers, academics who are studying this kind of stuff, uh, or 
people with similar credentials who are working inside the game industry. So, you know, maybe they're game developers, maybe they are working in sort of a behavior modification team or a user experience team within a game publisher or developer. Uh, and then, you know, other authors and, and people who can sort of have expertise on those topics to share. Mm -hmm. that, that's pretty much it, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. Unfortunately for my cast, I'm the one. I have to do a lot of the talking. <laughs> I don't get yeah. a break there. So as the people watching know, like we have, they usually have a little best to see whose voice runs out first, mine or the guests. Yeah, so we'll, we'll switch it up. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We'll see what happens. But yeah, like as you said, with College of Games going on its ten years now, like mm -hmm. it's very interesting. Like. Like, I started Game Wisdom in 2012, so we're going to be hearing about our seven-year anniversary, I think, this October. The September or October, I always forget what month that was. But, yeah. like, the discourse around game design and game development, like, it's been very fascinating. To It's kind of been, like, very slow, I feel, in terms of getting, like, you know, universal acceptance. or even just acceptance in the academia space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you mean in terms of sort of the structured academic yeah. study of game design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're starting to see, I think, the industry mature. And I, I'm not a game designer, so I don't, I can't really speak to with much authority on, on this sort of stuff. But it seems like you're seeing the maturity of the industry and you're seeing people, um, you know, want to start studying the things that they grew up mm -hmm. loving, you know, and playing. So you're getting people who grew up playing Halo or, or Mario or you know any of any of these games from previous generations and they're getting to the point in their career when they can kind of say like okay I want my research budget you know dedicated towards studying these kinds of things whether it's from a psychology perspective or communications or uh, you know media studies or uh, even just game designers you know like what is the the academic way to study game design uh, where it can kind of draw from any number of those different fields. Um, so it, I think it has a lot to do with the maturity of the industry and the people sort of growing up uh, and wanting to make those kinds of careers out of the things that they loved as kids and continue to love into their adulthood. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you brought up the term adulthood, because again, like, we <laughs> both grew up, you know, in the era where video games are only meant to be toys, you know, you would grow out of the game industry or grow out right. of video games, and it's kind of gone the complete opposite direction. It has, yeah. The average uh, age of, of people who play games is, you know, in their 30s and probably getting older uh, all every year. And sort of the <clears throat> the boundary of what is a game and what isn't has expanded a lot. <laughs> so, you know, you can... used to be you would just play games on a... Uh, a dedicated console or maybe a computer, but now you know everybody has a gaming console in their pocket. Um, oh yeah, they can play. They can play on their phones uh, anytime that they want. Um, you can play games through web browsers, and it's super simple. And now we're going to have like streaming services like Google Stadia uh, and some of the other subscription download services that uh, will work on all kinds of devices, and probably in the near future that. You know, there may not be a box. It looks like we're in for at least one more generation of box you put on a shelf and plug into your TV. But uh, after that, who knows? Although that's yeah. what we said last generation too. So yeah. we'll see. And like as just a complete like as a weird tangent there, I remember when the Xbox One was like first announced was like five six years ago. I've completely lost track of that. But like that's Microsoft like got like raked over the coals for saying, we don't want to have a disk drive, we want to be an old digital platform. And, mm -hmm. you know, everybody rioted. And now we fast forward to this year, and, like, pretty much everyone has come around to that. Yeah. I guess we just weren't ready then. Yeah. I, I, I'm still not sure I'm ready <laughs> yeah. to give up my physical media, but I may be a, a bit of a dinosaur that way. <laughs> I, I have at least moved into the I'm okay with digitally owning uh, yeah some things, um, certain games that I will just buy off of Steam. You know, I, I don't, my computer doesn't even have a disk drive. Uh, it doesn't have any kind of optical drive. It's all, yeah. any game that I get on there is downloaded. Yeah, I have a uh, portable, I have a uh, external 
uh, yeah. drive that I have ready to set up. But yeah, it's suddenly a very weird time. I mean, we could spend like three hours just reminiscing just about that easily. Yeah. Um, but I guess before we get to some of our main topics, I kind of have like a little bit of a grab bag of topics I want to throw by you, Jamie. Kind of like something that's been going on in the news mm-hmm. and, you know, big things. I just want to get your thoughts on, again, approaching things from a psychology point of view. Yep, sure. So I guess the first one, probably the most recent, is, of course, I guess, what games have you had a chance to be playing? Like, have there been any games that kind of, like, influenced your thoughts or some of the work that you've been doing? I have kind of been in a dry spell um, when I, I've been finishing up the the book and then I had a family vacation, so I haven't been playing a whole lot of stuff. I, I played through part of um, Crackdown 3, but it was just because I signed up for like the trial of the Xbox Game Pass, mm-hmm. and for I got it like three months for a dollar or something. I was like, I'll play this, and played through a few hours of it, and sort of like, okay, I've experienced that, and uninstalled it. Um, but I haven't been like deep into anything. I'm trying to remember what the last game a few weeks ago that I really played. It was probably be, oh, I know what it was. It was I did uh, finally finish a playthrough of Bloodborne. Um, that I went back to because I bounced off of Sekiro. Um, oh. I'm I'm one of the people that that game just did not click with. Um, oh. I couldn't I couldn't get the parry mechanic down uh, reliably, and I got to um, the part that I think a lot of people bounced off of it, which was the the boss fight at the top of the castle. Mm. I won't say anything more than that, but <laughs> a lot of people uh, had trouble with that, and I tried for like four days straight of going back and, and trying dozens of times each day uh, and just, it's just a brick wall I was like, I this game's not for me, I hate it, I hate everyone associated <laughs> with this game uh, forever uh, and then I, I calmed down a little and thought maybe I should finally finish Bloodborne to try to <laughs> scratch this mm-hmm. itch, because I had, I had like three, started Bloodborne three times I think and just had kind of gotten into it pretty far but then something else came along like another game distracted me and then it's like oh I'm going to go back to Bloodborne but I should probably just start over from fresh so That's I finally funny. yeah finally made it through finished it uh, and then made it through like another half of another playthrough uh, with a DLC and everything uh, before, before getting distracted by something else <laughs> oh yeah I, I'm kind of sad that you brought up Sekiro, Jamie, because I have so yeah. many thoughts I want to talk to someone about with that game. We'll see if we can fit it in, maybe after our main <laughs> discussion, but worse comes worse, I may have to rope you back in for a follow-up cast, because I need to have, like, yeah. a Sekiro, uh, I guess, breakdown discussion with somebody who's played the game. <laughs> well, I, I think I, it's probably something I will go back to eventually. I'll probably give it another honest try eventually, so I'll I'll let you know when that happens, and maybe we can talk about it. (laughs) All right. So I guess the other, of course, news is that we are officially in, I guess, Steam sale summer 2019 season. So has anything uh, managed to, like, rope you into spending money yet? Not yet. I got an email that said, like, 412 of your wish list (laughs) items are on sales, which uh, made me think that I have too much stuff on my wish list. Um, But, yeah, I have not picked up anything there because I think I have a pretty healthy backlog and then I want to try out the the Microsoft Game Pass and the PC uh, Game Pass beta that they're running right now um, just to try because there's like a lot of games that I think that I would like to either sample or just kind of short games that I try to blow through uh, quickly and a subscription service seems like a good way to do that until the next big AAA uh, <laughs> game comes out that I want to actually like own and add to my library. Mm-hmm. What about you? Have you bought anything on the Steam sale? I'm debating buying like some small like indie games. I'm trying to find more like little hidden gems out there. But mm-hmm. like in terms of like AAA wise, the like, nothing is really like catching my eye at least on that front. Yeah, that tends to be what it is with the Steam games these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, Early days, years ago, it'd, it'd be like I'd, I'd buy all these big title games, but now it seems like I own all of them. And if I really want to play something, I'll I'll tend to buy it pretty close to release. And by the time it rolls around at a healthy discount on a Steam sale, like, I'm like oh, I already have it. 
Yeah. So the other thing, of course, everyone's been talking about is the Epic Games Store, Steam's mm. big competitor, and people, you know, kind of losing their minds on forums and on YouTube about it. So right. I guess, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Kind of like Steam having maybe some legitimate competition. Yeah, I think it's good. Um, more competition they have, they were pretty much it for PC games. Yep. Uh, at least for AAA, I mean, you, you had all sorts of outlets for indie games and, and smaller games and a few companies uh, like uh, EA had you know Origins and stuff like that, but that was something you only installed if you wanted to play, a, you know, if you had to, to play a game that you wanted to play from them. It wasn't like a storefront that you actively used. At least it wasn't for me, anyway. Yeah. But, yeah, I think any um, competition is good. I think that there's, uh, you know, the idea is the consumer in the end will benefit from whatever they have to do to, to draw big titles to each other. Um, kind of don't want to end up in a situation where I have half a dozen different yeah. clients that I have to run. Um, makes me think of going back to the days before iTunes when <laughs> MP3s were sort of becoming all the rage and everybody wanted you to download and install their own like custom MP3 player uh, in, in order to, to play their songs and their uh, DRM protected you know, <laughs> music. And that stuff sort of got sorted out uh, eventually, um, and then they, then that solution got replaced by streaming, and now iTunes is, I guess, gone or on its way out. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, the Epic Store seems like a smart move. They got 140 bajillion Fortnite installs, so you know, for the longest time, that was the only thing that I had installed from the Epic Store. Uh, and you know, because and I don't even play Fortnite, but figured I had to check it out and, <laughs> and at least see what was going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, no, I'm I'm glad. I, I haven't really actually been following the controversy angle to it. What are people's like complaints? Just that they would rather have everything in one place. Yeah, and the idea of having a platform exclusive titles. Uh, you know, Phoenix Point, Outer Wilds. Um, what was the other one? Oh, There's a big one. Mm -mm. Why can't I remember it? Uh, Rebel Galaxy Outlaws. That wasn't the one I was thinking about. Oh, man. Uh, the Metro Exodus, I think, is exclusive. Is and really? one of them. I think it's exclusive for, I think, a year or maybe six months. Things like that. Yeah, that, that tends to be what they are, right? It's mm -hmm. timed exclusives unless yeah. it's um, a first party, you know. Epic game, I suppose, would be forever or could be forever exclusive there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that stinks, but I got a lot of choices in, in games that I can play. Yeah. There's no there's no shortage of games, and if I do want to play something, it doesn't seem like that big an ass to install. You know this this storefront. Mm -hmm. um, I may, like I said, I may change that opinion if <laughs> they continue to proliferate and. Then there's three and four and five and ten yeah. different different storefronts, but then maybe I'll pick a few that I stick with and sort of ignore the rest. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I bought a PlayStation and an Xbox just to play some first party games, just so I could have access to everything. So yeah. this seems okay. Yeah, I have my Switch and PS4, so I'm I got yeah. I covered as many bases as I could there. <laughs> yeah. Right. Although those purchases were a year and a half or so, yeah. two years apart. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever bought consoles like back to back. Yeah, yeah it's a little uh, <laughs> too much for my blood, too rich for my blood. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I saved the two biggie topics for last for you, Jamie. So I hope you're ready uh -huh. for this. All so, right, let me, let me settle in. All right. <laughs> so. Hey. The first one, of course, has to do with the whole loot box discussions. Whether it's... I'm, I'm sorry, I think you mean surprise mechanics? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was a Canner Egg uh, systems that EA has been uh, trying to do whatever they can to keep them in. And 
it has been very interesting to see like developers and publishers do what they can to keep those mechanics in. I had a discussion with uh, Ramin Shogazad, who does a lot of like video game. Uh, he's a video game economist. He does a lot. Mm. Of talks about that. We had a very lengthy, lengthy chat on that. But I want to get your thoughts on this as well. Like, w- like from where you're sitting, like what do you think about the whole loot box? angle and whether it should or shouldn't still be allowed to be in games. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's a tricky and kind of complicated set of questions that you just asked. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate loot boxes and I don't generally don't like games or see them at best as detracting from my liking of games that they're in. Um, especially to the extent that they require you know, purchases um, to real money purchases or something that you have to grind out and play forever uh, to earn up enough in-game currency. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're annoying, and you always get are left with the feeling that, like, well, the best are they designing this game around the loot boxes and trying to get me to to pay money or mm-hmm. to uh, keep playing beyond the point where I'm having fun in order to get me to to go through the loot boxes and that that concern is kind of always in your head like well they wouldn't be in here if they weren't beneficial and because they're beneficial they're motivated to try to get people to engage with the loot box and and so forth so I'm not a fan I prefer that they not be there Um, I would much rather have the option to just simply buy any cosmetic items that I wanted or any other types of gameplay items uh, that I wanted although sort of in games where we've seen that happen for some reason, the pricing is kind of all out of whack. It's like, well, no, I want to pay like 99 cents for that weapon skin, not $15 yeah. <laughs> or whatever it often ends up being, uh, especially for when, when stuff is, is newly released. And maybe the economist that you talked to had some insight there. Uh, I'll have to go back and listen to that uh, that conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the follow-up question or the additional question you asked is like, should they be allowed... Uh, to be there mm-hmm. um, and that that's a trickier question I'm not sure that I trust the government to to regulate this stuff because mm-hmm. they don't really understand a lot of times um, what video games are what loot boxes are how they work where the boundaries should be drawn what qualifies as a loot box and, <clears throat> and what doesn't um, what's too close to gambling and what is is acceptably different um, so I would think that self-regulation within the industry is probably the best way to go much like it was uh, you know and after the hearings that sort of spawned the, the ESRB uh, in the United, United States or North America where the game industry sort of got its act together and did like a voluntary rating system that we're all probably familiar with mm-hmm. that would be ideal <clears throat> and you do see you know, a lot of the loot box stuff falling out of favor with, with some games. Um, you know, they they taken them out of... You've seen them taken out of games. Like, Heroes of the Storm by Blizzard took out loot boxes, or at least the kind that you can buy with real money. Um, and there was another... There was another game that took it out recently that I can't remember. Um, and you see it actually, like, touted as like, marketing... Uh, or like a selling point for a game, yeah. like yeah, we don't have loot boxes. We took out loot boxes, and which on the one hand is cool, but on the other hand, it's like, well, you can't really take credit for creating a problem and then solving it. Like, I'm not sure that's the way it works, or I'm not sure that's fair. Like, yeah, we ruined the game by putting them in, and now we've taken them out. So yay us, um, good job, I guess. Um, but okay, you know, I'm glad glad they're out. Um, so you, I mean. It does seem, in a lot of ways, that the industry is moving away from them, but you still have companies like EA who have not really talked about taking card packs out of, uh, like, FIFA or um, any of their other big games. You know, they're going to continue to be around. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people, you know, that I talked to, and I I had an episode uh, of my podcast, there were Psychology Games, Dot com where I talked with like a researcher who has looked at sort of the, the correlation between um, 
problematic gambling and loot boxes because that's the question that a lot of people have or that's the justification that a lot of people present for outlawing loot boxes or regulating them to some extent is that well they're the same as gambling or they're problematic in the same ways and for the same reasons that gambling is problematic you know and so this this guy uh, David Zendel um, had looked at problematic gambling behavior and loot boxes uh, and how much people spent on loot boxes and found you know like a correlation there that the more you spent on loot boxes and video games the more likely you were to have gambling problems you know to, to gamble too much and spend too much money and they had various standardized ways of measuring this stuff and quantifying it so um, you know this the same criteria for problematic gambling behavior that is used in other research is generally accepted by academics in, in that field. Um, but, you know, we talked about the fact that it was just like a correlational study and sort of, you know, research methods 101, everybody learns that causation or correlation doesn't mean causation and it could be that gambling too much makes you like loot boxes or it could be some other third factor that makes you do both things, uh, both gamble too much and spend a lot on loot boxes. <laughs> so the research in this area is suggestive that you know there's a relationship there or that maybe some people who are at risk for problematic gambling are also at risk for spending too much on loot boxes but more research is needed uh, in this kind of area and I think especially more research is needed if you're talking about um, regulation and having somebody go to a hearing and and talk to policymakers and sort of try to answer those questions of should this be regulated is this a, a public um, you know problem a consumer problem you know should you try to protect consumers from loot boxes in the same way that you protect, protect consumers from other um, behaviors on from companies predatory or not um, so it's complicated I don't like them I prefer they weren't there more research is needed <laughs> to sort of to sort of understand um, the implications or the effects of them. And if you're gonna if you're gonna wave the won't somebody think of the children flag, then okay. But I think that you need some science to back up those those claims, and you're not just sort of operating on a, on a moral panic. Um, so the problem is that science moves real slowly a lot of times because it takes time and money. Uh, to do these studies and then it takes more time to publish them and then it takes more time and effort to get the results in front of the people who need to consume that research in order to make policy decisions or even purchasing decisions. So um, the rate of research there doesn't always keep up with sort of the need and the rate at which the industry can sort of seize on something like loot boxes for short-term gains and have it proliferate to the point where they start showing up everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's going to be very interesting uh, to see about what is going to come about, especially when it comes to the basically the gamer population. Because again, a lot of people have really gotten tired of it, and yeah. I, I think like I think I'm in the same place as you are in terms of my thoughts. Like the games that I play that have them, I'm not interested in spending money on them, but. Mm -hmm. Again, like we can see, you know, the whole idea, like the conversation about whales being yeah. a big part about it. It's like games are, or they have been, they probably will be designed to keep people or to convince them to spend money on loot boxes. Yeah, and I thought that was an interesting part of the conversation that I had <clears throat> with one of my podcast guests was around, you know, you can often put out the argument that let the market settle this issue right that if if people if consumers hate loot boxes so much they'll stop buying games um, where they're prominent and then companies will stop making it because they don't want to make products that people don't buy and that sort of makes sense in a way but in another way there's almost like there's, there's two markets there's the whales who spend a ton of money yep. uh, on these types of games and then there's the rest of us and mm -hmm the games are a lot of times and this is I think even more true in uh, mobile games where they're designed to get money out of the whales and designed to keep the whales playing and keep them engaged and the rest of us you know either suffer along or pay occasionally and probably have 
house experience uh, as a result. And so it's it's like you can't vote with your wallet and be part of the market that drives mm -hmm. the resolution of this problem because there's another market. Like you're not part of the market that is driving uh, decisions and business business decisions. Uh, other people are, are part of that market. Mm -hmm. um, Oscar asked a question for you a, few, a minute ago. Uh, the person that you spoke to about doing the study on like loot boxes, um, mm -hmm. he said, did the guy say what range of ages during the uh, population sample? I believe that one was mainly like teens and and young. Well, no, it wouldn't have been because they looked at gambling behavior. So I think it was it was relatively young people, but they were all like 21 you know, able to gamble uh, and able to go into casinos and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd have to look at the citation to be sure, but yeah, I, they weren't looking at kids. It's it's real hard to do that kind of research on kids. Um, one, because kids aren't allowed in casinos yeah. by and large and they can't, they don't gamble. Um, <laughs> as a population, kids have very few gambling problems, but <laughs> once they turn old enough to get in casinos, that may or may not change. Um, but it's it's real hard to do research on sort of at risk populations like you know children, um, prisoners, uh, the elderly, those kinds of people. Like review boards at universities and other institutions that uh, give approval and funding for doing this kind of research are rightfully so very protective of those groups. Mm -hmm. And. Um I guess the other question I want to ask you, and this is one that came up a few weeks ago, and was some that was kind of talked about earlier in 2019, late 2018, was, of course, the World Health Organization officially defining a gaming disorder. Right. So, you know, I had to definitely ask you about this, again, with your background. Like, what did you make of that whole little escapade when people started getting upset about that? <clears throat> yeah, so I, I am on the side of the people who think that it's unwarranted and that it probably does more harm and has the potential to do more harm than good mm -hmm. uh, because what they have done and, and what the the DS, DSM-5 or the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the, the manual that psychologists in North America use to um, sort of diagnose people uh, with mental uh, issues and, and disorders. Uh, they propose something similar in internet gaming disorder. Um, so it, it's it's not quite at the same level as the World Health Organization in terms of like, this is an official thing. But I think both of those approaches to studying gaming disorders or gaming addiction, even though they don't actually use the word addiction anywhere in their description, but oddly enough, like the gaming disorder is in the same section uh, as like, other addiction like drug and alcohol and other substance addiction so it's pretty clear what they're talking about mm -hmm. you know but I, I think there's a few problems with that approach and with that um, inclusion one is that again research in that area is sketchy often and incomplete uh, often there's not a whole lot of really good research <clears throat> on this topic of, of you know are people addicted to games or how prevalent is gaming addiction? How often are people addicted to games? What's the difference between being addicted to to playing a game and just being super engaged with it and, yeah. and you know, backing off when the weekend is over or when this, your summer break is over and you have to go back to school or work? Um, so the body of, of research is just not real solid there. And it could be, and it should be. Um, and hopefully more people will be doing research in that area. Um, I also think that it runs a big risk of stigmatizing a normal behavior. Yep. <clears throat> I mean, millions and millions and millions of people play games every day, uh, and they do so without any sort of issue. And suddenly, when you have this uh, World Health Organization gaming disorder um, diagnosis out there or, or criteria out there, then you can start looking at, beha at normal behaviors like that and those rules around whether or not somebody has this disorder uh, are open to a lot of interpretation yep. and people could be stigmatized and uh, seen as having some sort of you know mental disorder or, men or mental issue um, that is was normal like a year ago <laughs> you know that was not uh, really it's something that people 
like I said, do day in, day out, millions of people do, uh, and, and it's not an issue for them. And yeah, I just, it just doesn't seem like it's very well defined and it's kind of kind of vague and you can replace, you know, gaming with some other activity that people like, you know, like exercising or gardening or uh, collecting this or that. And if you just make that one little change, you could also like diagnose them with, you know, gardening <laughs> addiction or gardening uh, disposition or, you know, whatever it is, you, you could make the same diagnosis. So uh, it's, it's tricky because, you know, there are stories and some of them I'm sure are true and people, maybe even people listening have experienced this or know somebody who did of, you know, somebody who do, does go through and have problematic gaming and where they can't stop and it mm-hmm. disrupts other parts of their lives and uh, disrupts the relationships that they have and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me, but you know the degree to which that is the case in the population, and sort of the criteria by which you can diagnose it. I don't, I don't think we really know or have a good grasp on that yet. Yeah. And again, it just runs parallel to the whole, you know, banning of rock and roll music a few decades ago. <laughs> you know, rock and roll being, you know, the tool, the devil, Dungeons and Dragons, the same thing. Yep. Yeah, and it, video games get their turn. Mm-hmm. Um, the, yeah, the term there is moral panic, where something new and weird and unknown comes onto the scene, and people who aren't familiar with it want to uh, take it as an opportunity to blame or make sense of or assign blame to uh, whatever bad thing they see, you know, happening like uh, in the environments. And like you said, you go back far enough, you go back to the '80s. It was rock and roll and Dungeons and Dragons, and and you go back further, and it was you know dancing, and you go back further, and like it was like literally crossword puzzles oh, no. uh, were described as as you know addictive and rotting young people's minds. And you go back further, and you know game like games like chess were uh, vilified for making young people waste their time. And then you know you go back even further, and Greek some Greek philosophers like I want to say Aristotle, but I probably got that wrong. You know, said that reading uh, rotted the mind because young people were better off memorizing texts instead of reading them. You know, memorizing stories instead of reading them, and it weakened their mind. Um, which isn't to say that s- s- there aren't things that do cause problems or weaken your mind. We can find examples of, of those, but there is like a, a pattern in a history of these kind of moral panics where something that's not really understood is is blamed. Uh, in a way that is very sensational and then it just sort of spreads and policies are enacted or even, you know, caretakers, parents and other caretakers will, you know, put a stop to it or object to it without really understanding or having much evidence behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's again like similar to loot box, there's going to be something that we're going to have to keep an eye on and just see what's going to develop over the rest of this year. Yeah, yeah, and I got a feeling that that the outcry is probably going to make some difference. Um, I don't think we'll see them go away. I don't, I don't think we'll see the the mobile game market change overnight or even anytime soon with the way that it monetizes free to play games. Um, but I think at least for those big AAA games, hopefully we'll see we'll see less of it for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm being selfish just because I don't like it as a mechanic. <laughs> Well, we'll see. And uh, before we get to our main topic, there's one other thing that I want to ask you about, Jamie, because I was saying mm-hmm. about this in terms of, like, VR and kind of the benefits of it. Have there been any, like, new studies or any new, like, looks at kind of, like, uh, the use of VR, whether it's in, like, a therapeutic point of view or just, like, its effect on people? So I haven't kept up with that research on, on VR. <clears throat> I know that there's... Uh, been a lot of research around, you know, think like what causes motion sickness and what causes people to become immersed, you know, and to experience what psychologists call spatial presence in VR. Uh, I got like a whole section of a chapter about that and get the Getting Gamers book. Um, but as far as other applications, I haven't really followed it that much. And maybe that's just me because I 
didn't ever invest in a VR rig. Like I don't own one, um, so I have not <laughs> been as interested in following up on it. But I bet somebody out there has. I should find them. Maybe talk to them. <laughs> Have them on the podcast. All right. <laughs> So, I think with that, let's get to our main topic, and it's a quick time check. We're about, let's say, maybe like 50 minutes in, like not counting our pre-stream. So, we'll yeah. shoot for maybe like, I would say, 25, 30 minutes, and uh -huh. if anyone has any questions, feel free to pose them, but we'll see how far we go here. But our topic for tonight is going to be kind of about motivation when it comes to playing video games, and most specifically, or more specifically, about hard games. One of the things that's kind of developed, especially with the rise of speedrunning and Kaizo games, have been definitely this kind of reappreciation of difficulty in titles. We can even go as far back as Demon Souls, FTL, and the like. But mm -hmm. we have certainly seen a lot more hard games being released, and with that comes like definitely different mindsets about playing games at that level. Again, like right. for myself, I have, you know, pounded my head against the wall playing Sekiro and Demon Souls and Same. what's the game I've been playing lately? Uh, they are billions as well. Yeah, yeah that's out of early access now. Mm -hmm. But yeah. there are people who the second they hit that wall, they're done. They're out there. They don't want to deal with it. And there's also been a lot of discussions about playability and accessibility excuse me, when it comes to playing these games as well, and whether or not you can or should allow or adjust the difficulty depending upon the player. So, mm -hmm. I want to get your thoughts about, this, especially from a, a psychology point of view, about I guess like that motivation to play something that is intentionally difficult or frustrating. Um, I'm sure you I'm sure you know about Kaizo games at this point, right Jamie? I'm not Sure, I'm familiar with that term. I oh. know about like massive core games, like Super Meat Boy, and okay. those types of things. What what is what does that term mean? Uh, Kaizo refers to basically, in basically these are like the highest difficulty when it comes to the most popular example would be 2D platformers, and okay. there's entire communities and modding uh, built around making Kaizo games, especially for. Uh, Super Mario Maker kind of brought into public eye, but there are many people who use um, there's an editing software to edit uh, Super Mario World or even any of the old yeah. Mario games to make their own levels. And Kaizo Design is basically about there is one and only one line through that level that will get you to win it. Anything right. else is death. So it's less about kind of improvisation and more about uh, basically performing that set routine. And mm -hmm. it's typically about playing a Kaizo game that for the hardest ones, you will probably die at least a thousand plus times over the course of playing that game until yeah. you get that pattern down perfectly. And probably like if you want to know more of seeing action, I think each one of the uh, awesome games or summer games done quick events will usually have a Kaizo game out there to play and it has become kind of a way for a lot of modders to kind of grow their recognition or their reputation it's become mm -hmm. very popular among people who run Mario Maker games which with Mario Maker 2 out now I'm sure we're going to see even more of that but right. it's definitely again you're not really playing the game in the same way that you're like you're adapting the game it's basically I know exactly every second what I need to do if I can do that, I will get through this level. If I mess up one point, we're done. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's interesting. There's probably a number of different ways to approach it. Um, I actually have a whole chapter in my upcoming book that's on this this question of like what how do games get you to to persist and yeah. How do they get you to get into the mindset where you feel like that if you practice and try and are flexible enough, then you can improve your skills and, and overcome challenges? Because you know you have a lot of people who may, who may take the the mindset that uh, I can try something and I'll try it a few times and then it's 
I'll just decide it's too difficult or I don't have the right skill set mm -hmm. uh, or there's some other factor in the environment that's preventing me from being successful and I'm just going to give up. And, you know, in a workplace, that's obviously bad because you want people who are more willing to look at a problem and when they encounter failure, figure out what to do differently, adapt, um, develop their skills appropriately, figure out which skills to develop and then eventually do better and succeed. And so, you know, there's a lot of psychology research around these different kinds of mindsets and these different dispositions that people have towards different kinds of goals. Um, so if you have like a um, learning goal, uh, learning goal mindset where you see goals as opportunities to stretch yourself and that you need to be able to struggle and fail on your way towards reaching a goal, that that's like what goals for is to help you improve and, and do better, you know, then you're much more likely to, when you encounter a problem, if it's in the video game or in a workplace, to do all those things that I just described, yeah. you know, adapt and improve and practice and take your time and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, versus somebody who has a performance goal mindset where they just see a goal as like an opportunity for them to demonstrate their ability. And if they're unable to demonstrate their ability, then they abandon the goal or they change the goal to something easier um, or, or, you know, something more in line with, with where their skills out. And, you know, people who are much more um, goal, learning goal oriented tend over time to outperform uh, other types of people uh, on difficult tasks and other types of tasks. And then there's the whole line of research. Um, <clears throat> uh, Carol Dweck, um, a uh, psychologist who has written, uh, wrote a book called Mindset about all this sort of stuff and different types of people and whether or not they, you know, have a fixed or growth mindset, which is largely, you know, the same thing as a learning goal orientation and a performance goal orientation. Mm -hmm. and the way that they react differently uh, to different kinds of challenges. And I think one of the, the great things about video games is that they encourage you to have that kind of growth mindset or that kind of learning goal orientation because, you know, when you encounter something in a game and fail, a lot of people, you know, to, well, to the extent that you figure it out and get better and get good even, I might say, uh, and, and eventually persist and learn how to figure that out. Like games are designed to encourage you to do that kind of stuff. So you can get into that habit and you can get into that mindset. I think that's one of the great values of playing games. One of the, the, the big lessons that they have to offer and one of the, the good benefits that they have to offer. Hmm. Um, so somebody who is used to approaching challenges like that and, and persisting, you know, they can develop that trait or have more of that trait naturally. And one of the other things I write about sort of related to that is this concept of learning agility, which is um, somebody's flexibility, um, how willing they are to, you know, try different things, to gather information, to collaborate with other people, uh, to go and look up information, you know, when they encounter a strange and new obstacle that they haven't encountered before. Uh, in the world of work, this has been studied for for decades. And the more flexible somebody is in their their learning orientation, the more successful they tend to be at complex jobs like you know manage management or uh, other types of complex job. Um, and the more they tend to like feedback about their performance. And this is yeah. true of people with growth mindsets as well. Is that they want to know? They want like tell me tell me what I did. Give me information about why I failed, not yeah. just that I failed, but like, what did I do wrong? Where where did I go wrong? What do I need to do better next time? And again, video games are engineered to give you good feedback, right? So a game is not going to be successful if, it, if you don't know why uh, things happen the way they do. If you don't know why you failed, why you died, why you weren't able to beat that boss yeah. or whatever. So successful games are, are designed and engineered to get like very specifically give specific pieces of feedback and to time it appropriately to maximize learning and to maximize uh, engagement and motivation to, to keep playing or to reload or go back and try with a different party composition or a different uh, loadout on your character 
you know, all these different kinds of <clears throat> things that you want to try to do. And in the book, I specifically use the example of Darkest Dungeon, which I think you're familiar with, yeah. right? <laughs> um, which sort of delights in punishing players for, for doing the wrong thing, but it's also not too difficult to try different things. So, you know, you go in and you get stomped in a dungeon repeatedly. Um, you can go back and try a different set of classes, uh, or you can try different trinkets or, or different equipment. <clears throat> and you can learn and you can kind of just keep going back to the drawing board and trying over and over again uh, to try different things. Um, so that's, you know, one response I have to the question of what about games that that are hard and that people fail at a lot. And I think that all is pretty applicable to games like, you know, the Dark Souls games and Sekiro and, and so forth. Um, the question of these uh, Kaiso games and these Massacre games where it's as much about persistence as it is finding the line through the level and figuring it out. And maybe it's not always apparent, like, maybe like there's a hidden spike or a hidden block that you don't know about until you run into it face first uh, as you're platforming through a level. Um, that's, I don't know, that's weird <laughs> in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways I don't get it because you're not getting that sort of feedback a lot of times. You're not given chances to easily improve um, and it does take a certain kind of person with a certain amount of skill yeah. and dexterity and familiarity with it and maybe Maybe it's just the same concept writ large um, or writ over a longer period of time where you really have to put in the time to get good at these games and to figure them out. Um, so maybe, maybe it is this, the same kind of same kind of thing. Mm. Um, and then there's you know eventually a great feeling of satisfaction when you finally do beat the level or the game or beat your time on the previous speed run or, or whatever it is. Mm. That you get that feeling of you know, that emotional joy uh, and feeling of accomplishment, what you do, and to the extent that you can share that with other people, like on a stream or get an achievement or, you know, sh otherwise share that accomplishment is uh, really motivating as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess, like, and of course you, now with Dark Souls as an example, like, like as you said earlier, that you stop playing Sekiro, and I think that's kind of like this weird, like yeah, makes this discussion. Yeah, like it's a very <laughs> weird thing, like how certain games will keep us coming back, and other <laughs> ones will just you know you know raise the white flag. Like for me, Kaizo is my white flag. I tried playing it, it just I was just not doing it, and I, I just did not enjoy myself. But you know, I. Uh, Punch! I you know kept punching that wall of Sekiro until I finally got through it. Mm -hmm. And I guess like, why do you think like do you think there's kind of like I'm not sure what the right term would be, almost like I guess like a range in terms of like how much of a how much work the person has to do in order to improve that if it gets too wide that they're just gonna say I don't want to do this anymore like. It's not yeah. enough. Like, there's not, there's too much here for me. Yeah, and I think for all of the the praise that I just had for games around building growth mindsets and learning agility, that there are walls sometimes, right? Like yeah. sometimes you just do run up against those walls. So, like in Sekiro's example, like I knew what to do. I, I knew how to beat that boss, and I even learned the patterns. Uh, I just didn't have the ability to sort of pull off the button combinations or something. Something wasn't working right. And so that was kind of extra frustrating because it's like, all right, game, I know what you want me to do, game, and I know what buttons I should press and when, but you know, my reaction time was not fast enough or my sense of rhythm was not good enough. And I actually, like, remember sitting there thinking on the millionth you died or mm -hmm. you know message uh, when I had to start over thinking about this this concept because you know I had written or at least drafted that part of the chapter yet and I, I, wrote, I wrote about learned helplessness and this kind of stuff um, on the website uh, a long time ago and I was thinking about it in that context and thinking about like 
well, do I just not have the right mindset uh, for this? And then kind of eventually coming around the conclusion that I bet that if I just keep banging my head against this, if I keep practicing, I'll develop the muscle memory, I'll develop the skill to eventually get to get through. But that would not be fun. That would and it would be a poor use of my time. And there are so many other games I I could be playing that I would be having more enjoyment out of. And this wasn't an issue of like sacrificing and and spending time for, you know, work or to provide for my family or for any of those things that would have been worth it uh, to, to put in that extra time. Just kind of came up against the realization that like, <laughs> maybe if I kept trying, I could get this, but, but why? Like, it's not going to be worth it. Because not only would that, that take a lot of long time, but there's probably going to be another boss or another <laughs> enemy or another sequence later in this game where I have to climb that hill all over again. And that's not fun. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to go do something that's fun. And I ended up playing through Bloodborne, <laughs> like I said. Just um, a different flavor of pain, basically. <laughs> yeah, and there were plenty of bosses that took me many tries in Bloodborne. Um, and the Orphan of Koss, I never actually did uh... end up beating. Who you may remember as the nightmarish boss from the DLC, mm -hmm. one of them. Um, never could get through that guy, never could even get any summons. Uh, to come help me because this was years and years after the DLC had come out and I guess not enough people were playing it or I was too high level by that point or whatever. Um, but, but yeah, I went I went and did something else. Had some other fun. And I gotta ask you, um, I'm sure like, you know like the game, I'm sure you know what XCOM is and you know mm -hmm. um, it, you know uh, Zach Tronics, right? Yeah. Like, those are, like, for me, like, Zach Trunks has been one of those games, like, it's, like, the opposite. Like, when I get stuck in one of his games, like, I just feel like I'm done. Like, I can't go forward. <laughs> but, again, like, it's always that difference of, like, what the game is asking you to do. Like, again, like, I'm sure everybody watching us, right, especially my regulars, we've all played roguelikes. We've played games where it is inherently designed for you to fail, and you have mm -hmm. to adapt to that failure. And... And actually, Rolex is actually a really good part of this conversation because there are people who despise roguelike design. They hate mm. that idea that I can I play this game and I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I could win or I could lose 50 times in a row. That's not fun for me. And then there's people like myself who we will roll that dice every time we play it and we'll enjoy it win, lose, or draw. Yep. Yeah, and I think one of the important things there with roguelikes is that you often have uh, like carryover progress between mm -hmm. runs. Um, uh, what was the the one I played fairly recently, Dead Cells, um, mm -hmm. where uh, this was great. That was a great game. Um, had a huge spike in difficulty at the end when you got to the end boss. But um, you know, I'd play and I die. I I make progress. I would have currency that I could spend on my next run um, or I had just knowledge of how to how to play against enemy types that I had seen for the first time and how to progress through the game even if it was the levels were largely randomized um, so I think you know if you can if a game allows you to sort of make some progress uh, each time that you fail uh, each time that you you know take a different run then that goes a long way towards motivating people to keep plugging away and keep keep going at it and that is again like one of the more interesting aspects behind roguelike design. And I was just thinking about this um, earlier in a video that I wrote on this upcoming game called uh, Children of Morta, which is like a kind of like a top-down action roguelike. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the uh, regulars watching this know what I'm about to ask you, but <laughs> we've seen that kind of division of roguelike design where there are roguelikes that you could theoretically beat the game on your very first run. It's going to be hard, and chances are maybe like 0.1% of the population who play the game can yeah. do it, but it Those is possible. Twitch streamers do it. Yeah. yeah. But then there are roguelikes that are built around that persistence element, or that persistent element, where mm -hmm. you literally can't beat this game until you get, you know, X amount of cells, or upgrade your sword to X level, or whatever like that. Mm -hmm. And... 
there are people and there are strong points both for and against it. Like for me, it was one of the things I didn't like about with Rogue <laughs> Legacy, that mm-hmm. it never felt like I was playing the game for this run, but I'm playing it eight to ten runs down the line once I've unlocked uh, increased yeah. weapon damage plus five or whatever. Yeah. Our new class or yeah. something. Yeah. So like I was just wondering like. For like, do you think like that is a factor for people who play like roguelike design? That there's that difference between I can just as a Oscar just put in chat like starting too weak, because we see that in all in many of like the smaller roguelikes where you'll start the game and no, you are not beating this game. Like if the first boss hits you for thirty points of damage and you only have twenty health to start with. You know, there's no amount of pro uh, player or pro pro game player who's going to get through that game. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so I mean, what's the question? If I have a preference, or if I think- I guess in terms of like that kind of rogue like motivation for playing games, that mm-hmm. as you said, we like that persistent element. Whether or not that can be viewed as a positive or a negative, depending upon the person's own attitude. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of research saying that. Uh, to the extent that you can make choices about how you play a game or how you approach a game, it's it's more motivating and you're likely to be engaged with it. So if you have the opportunity over many different runs to purchase different kinds of equipment or to spec in different areas or choose different classes, then I think that's going to be inherently more motivating um, than it just go you know go at it. Here's here's your you know, you run, and if you don't make it, then you liter- you start back literally at ground zero with no progress. Um, so I think so sort of the choice and the progression inherent in the uh, carryover type of approach is, is going to make it more motivating. Mm-hmm. And there's one other kind of like follow-up to our discussion about difficulty that I want to ask you, Jamie. And mm-hmm. that's about this idea of raising up or lowering the difficulty in games. Because this is another like very interesting part when it comes to video games. I think probably is a unique to video games compared to other things. Because mm-hmm. in games, we can make a game easier or harder if those options are available. And mm-hmm. I was just wondering, there has has there been any like study or research done regarding you know people who would raise the difficulty of the game up versus those who would lower the difficulty down? I'm not familiar. I can't recall any studies that specifically looked at looked at that um, off the top of my head or anything that I've encountered before. Uh, I think a lot of it goes back to what I mentioned earlier about autonomy and choice. So, like, if you if you have the option to play on an easier difficulty or a harder difficulty, um, then people are probably going to be more likely to stay engaged with that. And and if they can deal with frustration by uh, you know changing difficulty even for you know just part of the game and then switching it back, then they like to have that option. Um, but then again. As I was talking about earlier, a lot of people like to take kind of a growth mindset to things and say, well, if I fail, how, what are my other options for, for dealing with that failure besides just make, you know, having the, uh, the boss's hit points or uh, making it so that they don't do certain attacks or, or summoning an NPC or another player to help me dish out damage uh, in the fight. So a lot of players may find that sort of approach more appealing as well. Um, but, I, you know, more generally in the camp of give players options yeah. uh, for dealing with that and make it clear to them the different difficulty settings and, you know, maybe <clears throat> come up with different ways of dealing with difficulty rather than just changing how hard enemies hit um, to where... You know, certain options are or are not available to you, or there, there's drawbacks, or you don't get to experience as much as you would if you played it on the higher difficulty level. Uh, enemies just behave in more interesting yet more challenging ways on higher difficulty levels. They're smarter, mm-hmm. you know, along those lines. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, and then the accessibility issue is is, is probably an important one as well. Like if they if somebody just lacks the manual you know dexterity to to go mm -hmm. through a very difficult or demanding part of the game, then giving them the option to just bypass that or um, get help somehow, you know, from another player or from an NPC or through grinding out experience or something um, allows that person to, you know, experience and enjoy the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. And I guess for you, like, do you, when you play games, do you typically play them on, like, easy, normal, or hard? Like, what's kind of, like, your preference? I generally just go whatever the default mm -hmm. setting is. I don't have the time a lot of times to go through and, and play on the hardest difficulty settings. Um, some games I may even turn down the difficulty if if the appeal of the game is <laughs> largely in like exploration or the narrative, for example, like Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I did this with of was like ah okay I can get through these fights. I you know I know how to approach them. I know how to equip my character and so forth, but uh, I've been doing it for 20 hours now, so I'm just going to play Content Tourist and turn the difficulty down and, and kind of just go through the game. I think that was the game I did that with. Okay. But I know I've, I've done it in the past with other characters. When, you know, the appeal of the game or the enjoyment that I'm getting from the game is independent of the difficulty. Okay. And a few questions from chat. Uh, Mike mm -hmm. asked us a few minutes ago. I couldn't figure out the best time to put it, but we kind of mentioned we touched on gamification earlier on the stream. But he wanted to know what do you think about gamification of societies like China's social point system? It's terrifying, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you're talking about the the social score or whatever it is that they have, where their their rights and their privileges as a citizen are dictated by. Uh, how well they've played the game, as defined by their overseers or defined by the government. Mm -hmm. uh, that stuff's that stuff's pretty terrifying, and that's obviously run amok and being used for for evil or for oppression, or certainly has the easy potential to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a fan, I uh. guess. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's not a surprising answer. <laughs> And uh, getting back to the topic about difficulty, Oscar brought this up in chat about one of our favorite games to talk about, and that's Celeste. Did you have a chance to play or look at the game, Jamie? No, I'm not familiar with that one. I've heard a lot about it, and I've heard that it's a very difficult game, yeah. but I've never played it. It's definitely on the high side on in terms of difficulty when it comes to platforming, and the game earned a lot of press and buzz around its assist mode, which is essentially just like a giant cheat menu that you can turn on any time. Mm -hmm. So it ha so what they describe in the game is that there are no penalties for using it. You know, you can play you could play every level of Celeste with infinite jumping, infinite lives. You know, mm -hmm. you can turn off literally all the difficulty of the game and go through it. And some people like that idea. I wasn't a big fan because I felt like it was kind of getting rid of the element of trying to play this game or learn it. And Oscar's point is, or the question is, should should it be allowed, or should the game allow you to play and win any type of game, no matter if you're into the genre or not? So, like, this would be like an example of, uh, let's say in the new Doom game that's coming out, that mm -hmm. the lowest difficulty of that game, you don't even need, let's say it's just complete auto aim assist like you don't even need to point your gun at an enemy the doom marine yeah. will take care of it all and all you right. could play through the game like that <clears throat> but is that you know i guess is that worthwhile of a mode to have well you, that seems like a question for the person playing the game yeah if, if they're having fun if they're enjoying it then the answer is pretty obviously yes right mm -hmm. um if uh you know i can't if I want to play Celeste that way and I still get a kick out of it, then uh, maybe Celeste doesn't fit this bill, but you know, other narrative-based games, and kind of like as I was talking about before, where there are other reasons to enjoy the game or other things to appreciate about the game, independent of difficulty, then sure, totally, why not? I mean, like the new, um, uh, what's it called, the, the Zelda version of Crypt of the Necrodancer, yeah. what's it? What's that one uh, called? Cadence of Hyrule, I think. Yeah, yeah, they have like a mode where 
you don't have to have any rhythm <laughs> to play and beat the game, where it basically turns it into a turn-based uh, game. And I think that's that's brilliant. Like, mm -hmm. Have that stuff in there. Let people choose yeah. um, the way that they want to play the game. And if they want to then engage with it at a harder difficulty to where they can get more out of it and develop their skills more, then if it's uh, worth it for them to do that, then they can. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other point I think I was making, if anyone can win, where is the motivation there? I guess it kind of goes to what we were talking about earlier with getting people to, I guess, motivating them to play through a game like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it depends on what you mean by win. Uh, mm -hmm. If you just mean like to finish the game, to, to reach the end of a game for games that where that makes sense, you know, games that do have an ending. Mm -hmm. um, sure, yeah, it's okay for, for everybody to win. I think a lot of people would like to be able to compare uh, oranges to oranges, though, and know, you know, under what conditions did you beat the game, and if I want to look and see that you got an achievement for beating the game, or try to beat your time on a racetrack or something, then being able to, to play or compare the same settings is, is going to be pretty important, right? Because people want to make those social comparisons um, in ways that allow them to look at people that are not only similar to them, but playing the game in a similar way to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, totally. I mean, I'm not, I'm not the gatekeeper of if you beat or won at a game. That's not my job. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Have a good time. Be happy. And I think, again, it comes back to, like, what the person is getting out of playing that game. Like, we were saying a few minutes ago, like, for me, I'm definitely motivated by, you know, the goal of completing it. Like, I will play, if it's an action-based game, I will try to play on, like, the hardest possible difficulty. I'll do whatever I can in that title. But, as you said, with games that have other reasons to play, maybe from a narrative point of view, maybe you just like these characters... Like, again, like, the Cadence of Hyrule example is, like, the perfect one, I think, for this kind of conversation. Because on one hand, like, I'm sitting here going, you know, Sekiro, Bloodborne, the whole Soulsborne series are meant to be challenging games. But mm -hmm. then on the other hand, like, I've said this before, I can't play Crypt of the Necrodancer. I have no sense of rhythm or any kind of musical beat. So having that mode and Cadence actually would open up that game to allow me to play it. Mm hmm yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, and you can push that to an extreme, right? And it's mm -hmm. it's only fun for so long to play in God mode where you yeah. kill everything in one shot and you don't take any damage and you can clip through walls and you've got all all of the guns and unlimited ammo and you know, that that's fun for a bit just for the spectacle of it, but eventually you're going to want to have some challenge and some, some meat to it, yeah. Some meat to it, but every, you know, where everybody is on that curve it differs from person to person so yeah. play, that, play how you want that actually brings up a very interesting point I want to ask you about Jamie like, as you were talking about earlier we're looking at like the psychological trends of why certain develop, why developers use certain mechanics or systems there's mm -hmm. one thing that's been bothering me for a long time as, we talk, as you just mentioned God Mode yeah. why do so many games as like kind of the ultimate reward for winning essentially gives them god mode. You know, you earn the infinite ammo rocket launcher in Resident Evil 2, but then you yeah. need like a S plus ring with every character to do so. Or right. you unlock infinite health, you have to beat the game in like one hour, 90% completion kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that does sort of seem like the thing you toss in after players have mm -hmm. squeezed everything else that they're going to get out of it. Um, you're not really afraid of ruining their fun, maybe, because they've already done everything in the game, and they've already mastered and are pretty awesome at it, even without the golden yeah. infinite rocket launcher. Um, yeah, it almost seems more like a gag than, than any sort of serious uh, gameplay design feature. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Is that is that real common? I mean, I haven't... I, I'm trying to think of games that I've encountered that have that, and most of them seem to be new, like new game plus options. Where yeah, yeah, you, you keep all of your awesome stuff, but 
now the game is just that much more hard. Yeah, a lot of action <clears throat> horror games I've noticed have done that. Dead Space, Resident Evil, The Evil Within. A lot of games with evil in the title. Yeah. But yeah, mm -hmm. like, again, it's just so weird. Like, a uh, Dragon Set and Shadow, you beat the game with skill, here's the gimmick version. And, mm -hmm. like, and, like, the weird thing for me is, like, I've like, all the games I play where I unlock, like, infinite ammo, infinite whatever, I don't play with that, because, again, like, it's like, what's the point at that, you know, if I can, I'd be Resident Evil 2 with an S-plus rating, with just, like, the pistol and, like, no cheats. Why do I want to play the game with cheats after I'm done? And the yeah. argument that a lot of people make is, you know, maybe that should be kind of like your playability or accessibility mode, you know, are you having trouble with the game? You know, here's infinite bullets, or infinite first aid spray or anything like that. Yeah. Well, yeah, and on the PC you have things like Cheat Engine that can mm -hmm. let you do that pretty much any time. Not that I would know. <laughs> All right. And well, the chat's bringing up God Hand. There's one other thing that I want to bring up in terms of I want to see what you take, what your take on this. It's kind of like when I hit this breaking point in playing a game. Mm -hmm. And that was playing the original Ninja Guide End trilogy. And everybody in chat knows exactly what I'm about to bring up here. But if you never played like, the first three Ninja Guide End games, you never played. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, if you never play them, what they do is that when you get to the final boss in those games, Mm -hmm. that it's always a series of bosses. Usually it's like between three or four different boss fights. Yeah. If you die during any of those bosses, you are forced to repeat the entire level to get back to that spot. Ooh. Yes, exactly. And it's it only they only do that for the final boss rush of each one of those games. Like if you when you die during a boss fight at any other point, it just restarts you at that boss if you have enough lives. Right. But, yeah. like, this was, like, where basically I felt like my blood pressure starting to skyrise. I was like, you know what? That's it. You know, I'm using save states. Like, I'm done. Like, I'm not repeating this for the next... Because it's basically, like, 40... Good, like, 20 to 30 minutes of getting back to that fight to then die to then repeat yeah. those same moments. And, like, despite my tendency to play games on, like, their hardest settings, I was like, no, done. I, I can't do this. Yeah. So, I guess, like, what do you think makes something like that, like, I guess I'm asking you to psychoanalyze me here, like, <laughs> why was that, like, the breaking point, considering I spent a good three, four hours trying to eventually gain past Genshiro and Sekiro? Yeah. Yeah, I I would not tolerate that either. That just seems kind of grossly unfair and arbitrary. Um, it, it's the game not respecting your time or your effort. Uh, and I have limited time to play games these days. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can get in and, and play for two or three hours in an evening or, or on a weekend day, then that's pretty good uh, between family and work and other projects. So... I don't have a lot of patience for games that, you know, waste your time with, with filler or repeating tasks or having to replay things like that. And it almost just seems like the game has gotten personal and nasty with you at that point. Uh, and it's just being unfair and, uh, and not respectful of your time. So I, I don't think you're weird at all for having that reaction. Uh, even if in the grand scheme of the time that you've spent with the game, it's not that much. Like, you've spent much more time, mm -hmm. you know, playing up to that point. Yeah. 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 No, no, you don't have to put it up with that. Go watch the ending on YouTube. Be done with it. <laughs> Get off well, I had to prove to people I could at least beat the game, but yeah, that was just a Do nightmare. Do you have to prove that to them? I guess, or they'll make fun yes. of me for who yeah, knows you're how a bit long. More public. A little bit more public facing, and you have an audience more so than a lot of other people have. So maybe you did. They're all yeah. judging me right now, too, <laughs> as they're watching this live or recorded. <laughs> yeah, you can feel it. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. So uh, for the people watching us live right now, I'm going to officially put out last call for any questions for Jamie now. So if you have any, please get them into chat. 
I guess regarding motivation around this topic, are there any mm. other parts that we didn't touch on that you'd like to bring up? Uh, not really. I mean, I just think that games and game developers have gotten very good at, at motivating behavior, right? So at getting people to keep playing, to stay engaged with a game, uh, and you know, sometimes that that's great, just through good, fun game design and narrative and other game mechanics that just make people have fun with the game or gets them like socially invested in it. You know, if they're playing with other people or uh, impacting other people, sometimes it's possibly less than fine through things like loot box mechanics and um, making you repeat three boss battles uh, <laughs> if if you die on the last one. Um, but they have gotten really good at uh, at motivating behavior, and I think that there's a lot that you can learn from that, and there's a lot to be aware of so that you know the tricks and you know what's going on and you can approach it on your own terms. You can say, like, okay, I, I can see the psychological levers they're throwing here, but that's okay because I'm having an awesome time and I'm on board. Uh, or you can say, I, I see what they're doing here, and I don't think I have to tolerate that or I have other options and I can I can move on so the the kind of stuff that I do and the kind of people that you know I interview and talk to or it's all about trying to get people to approach games on their own terms and sort of understand what's going on there and realize that it, it's not always bad right it's all it's probably most of the time done in service of giving you a better gaming experience um, but when it's not or when it is but it's just not hitting for you then an awareness of of how these things work and why they work can go a long ways yeah and, and i think that's kind of interesting about as we said when it comes to moving someone via like these kinds of challenges and there's one other thing that I was just thinking about. We, I know we brought this up on an earlier podcast. We talked about achievement design in video games. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think achievements have had a noticeable effect on getting people to either play games or play them differently than what they would normally do? I don't know. The, the stuff that I've seen sort of suggests that, that there's a lot of individual differences there. Like, some people couldn't care less about yeah. achievements and they don't motivate them. They don't track. They don't. They may like it when the little bleep thing pops up on their screen and says that they did something, and like ah, cool. But then, not go and check to see like what other achievements could they earn if they did X, Y, and Z. Um, and then other people that do chase those kinds of, oh, yes. of behaviors. So my my kind of un you know unscientific probably and not completely based in research reading is that. There's a lot of individual differences there, and it, it clicks for some people and it doesn't uh, for others. But it seems like achievements have kind of been less prevalent in, in recent past. I mean, the whole gamer score or yeah. the, whatever the PlayStation equivalent is, the trophy yeah. system yeah. there, um, there's like not even anything really on the Wii or on, or on the. Uh, any of the Nintendo platforms, like the Switch or, or anything else like that, um, yeah. seems like it's kind of been fading. I don't know. Do you do you get that feeling? You're probably more connected to that kind of stuff than I am. It still seems like it's important or interesting for like the PC side of things. Like when we brought up Steam earlier, the fact that Steam tracks all your achievements and all that has been, I think, kind of helping things out. But yeah, like it's weird that we. Like, I talked about this a few weeks ago in a post I wrote about trophy room game design and kind of designing, like, in-game representations of achievements. Mm -hmm. And how, like, it doesn't seem like many people have gone forward with trying to elevate or evolve what achievements are. Like, I still see games where it's like, you press start, you get an achievement. You know, yeah. like, they just have to get, like, the bare number, I guess, and make the platform happy. Right, get through certification, yeah, uh, whatever yeah. it takes, yeah. Like, for me, like, my favorite achievements are those that do make you think about the game differently. Like, we just did uh, Half-Life 2. Like, there was the uh, one free bullet challenge where you have to beat the entire Episode 1 DLC 
without using your bullets. You can only use your gun one time. Everything else must be grenade, <laughs> rocket launcher, gravity gun, or crowbar kills. And yeah. that, you know, that literally changes how you're supposed to go through Half-Life 2. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of fun. But yeah, then there are those games where it's like, beat the entire game using your pocket knife and not leveling up and no health upgrades. I'm like, yeah. I'm sure that's possible, but... <laughs> I have no desire to, you know, subject myself to that. Like, there's a limit to my masochism. Like that Soul, uh, Dark Souls games where it's like, don't rest at any bonfires, uh, uh, get all the way through it at Soul Level soul 1. Soul Level 1, yeah. For the people yeah. who do that, congratulations. I've watched, <laughs> I've watched, like, videos of people do that mm -hmm. from Twitch streams or, or what have you, and it's just like, wow, okay, mm -hmm. but you played this game a thousand times, uh, and hats off to you. Yeah, like uh, someone did a run of all the Soul Soulsborne games without getting hit it. one time. Yeah, and I'm it just was like lead up to Sekiro, right? Yeah, I'm, Sekiro. I'm like that will never happen. I will never accomplish that task in my entire life. I don't think the developers even thought that. <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah, it's cool to see mm -hmm. see somebody else do it. But the developers <laughs> did think to put in the achievement for no resting in a bonfire. So oh, God. <laughs> they must have thought that somebody would do it or could mm. do it. Whew. And I guess here's my final question about motivation for you, Jamie, and then we'll wrap it up. I we I mentioned a few minutes ago regarding kind of the rise of speedrunners. Like mm -hmm. like do you watch like speedrunning or any kind of speedrunning like, when they do like the AGDQ? Yeah, that just went on recently, right? Yeah. Uh, is there still going on? I think it is going on this week. I think this is yeah. the week that it's happening. Right. Well, and my question, though, is kind of like the motivation, again, for playing games at that level. Because we've mm. spent the last hour or so talking about, you know, like, general consumers. But mm. there are, of course, people who will play games, like, at that level, where we're not just talking about playing the game. We are talking about breaking it in half at that point. Yeah. And kind of that motivation, like... I guess, is there, like, have there been any studies or, like, any discussions about, you know, people who are motivated at that level to play through a game? Even if it is a simple game, because we've seen people speedrun Dark Souls, we've seen them speedrun, like, even, like, simple games as well. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, no, I don't know of any, any research that's looked at that, but sort of the interviews that I've seen with those people or the commentary that they give while they're doing the speedrun, uh, if you listen to it, a lot of times it's it, you know, it, it's not about the game. It's about break how to break the game creatively and like finding and capitalizing on glitches that let you, th you know, travel across the top of the skybox on a level or fast forward and you know do sequence breaking and access parts of a game that you shouldn't be able to access yet. Mm -hmm. And the challenge um, becomes being able to do that stuff and finding out about it and like that whole community I think like there's a whole scene there where people discover and share like these secrets and these different ha uh, hacks and different ways to, to break the game and do things that it was never supposed to allow Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of the appeal probably comes from the discovery of that sort of stuff and, and learning how to do it and maybe plotting out the ideal way to progress through a game and shave off a few seconds if you you know go this path versus this path or collect this item or skip this boss or whatever it is like what's the optimal way to go about doing that and it becomes just another like a new challenge a new problem it's no longer about playing the game or beating the game it's about finding the optimal way uh, to, to break it kind of to get either they kind of similar to like what we were talking about with Kaizo games earlier. That when you're playing a Kaizo game, Could be. you are you're trying to you know solve the mystery there. You're trying to crack that code. And again, like it all depends on what motivates that person to play. 
But, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we could easily talk who knows how much longer. And again, uh, we need to have a Sekiro chat at some point. If you can <laughs> uh, rise up to the challenge and <laughs> try to get through yeah. that. <laughs> Maybe I'll rebuy it on PC and use Cheat Engine to uh, slow the combat down or something. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> then that'll, that'll give us something to talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can tell all the Sekiro fans. We'll have a conversation <laughs> about, you know, hacking Sekiro. I'm sure they're, they're going to love that one. <laughs> I'll say, you didn't earn that, and I'll say, don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Got to see the rest of the game. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, but Jamie, it has been a pleasure hanging out with you again. Yeah, Best same. of luck with your second book. And, of course, again, congratulations on your 10-year anniversary coming up. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. All right, before I let you go, do you have any final thoughts on the topic? Or if you just want to mention your social media, you know, for people can find you, go right ahead. Yeah. yeah, so I've written a lot about all this stuff and various other psychology and video games topics and dozens of issue, uh, dozens of episodes of the podcast. Best place to go find all that stuff and find out how to contact me or follow me on social media is psychologyofgames.com. You can go there, access hundreds of articles that I've written, all the podcasts, uh, follow, you can find out how to follow me on Twitter. I'm at Jamie Madigan. I've got a Facebook page for the website. Um, you can find links to my Patreon uh, and uh, sign up for my newsletter if you're interested in uh, that stuff. You can get content from the website and um, latest news about book you know, release dates and all that sort of stuff there. So psychologygames.com, that's your, your first stop. Awesome. All right. Well, I think with that said, we are going to end things here for our cast tonight. For the people watching this live, thank you for tuning in. I'll be back probably in the next 30 minutes or so for our regular game streaming. For people enjoying this recorded, if you like an ad-free version of this talk, be sure to check out patreon.com slash wbicer and sign up for VIP access. But, uh, Jamie, hopefully in the future we can have you back on. I'm sure we can come up with any number of topics we can discuss next time. Yeah, anytime. Thanks, Josh. This was uh, cool. I always uh, like coming on. Appreciate your, the invitation. Not a problem. If you wouldn't mind hanging on Discord for like 20 seconds after we wrap up, I just have a few last-minute things to ask you. But totally. Other than that, folks, be sure to check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where you some of the art and science of games. And if you are working on a game or in the industry and would like to come on for a chat, please don't hesitate to get in touch. But other than that, I'll see you live, folks, a little bit later tonight. For everyone else, have a great evening.